Masachet Ketubot, we begin with more cases of contradictory testimony. We have a Baraita. Ten Rabbanan, Shenaim Omrim Nit Kadesha, Ushnaim Omrim Lo Nit Kadesha. Two witnesses say this woman was engaged and two say, no, it didn't happen. I might be talking about a specific time period where we know there was something going on, some kind of ceremony. Was there actually Kiddushin there? So two can say yes, two can say, no, we were there. And at that time, there was no Kiddushin. Harezo Lotina said that woman cannot remarry because you have two against two. Uh, so therefore, Lechetechila, she cannot marry. But if she did get married, Bidiyavad, even though it was not advised by the court, she doesn't have to leave. Again, because it's two against two, so it's doubt. So uh, the same doubt that says we shouldn't act to get married would say also don't act to get divorced, to force them to divorce. Uh, if she marries, it's not another guy. In this paraita, we have the second case, which is if two witnesses say, we saw she was divorced, and they may point to a particular date and time, we saw there was a divorce given, and two, and the other two say, no, that was not a divorce paper, it was a loan document, it was something else, and uh, uh, he never gave it, she never received it, and they're not divorced, and therefore she may not marry. So this person, because there's two witnesses against her, she cannot marry. But in this case, if she does go against the recommendation of the court and marries a second husband, the court forces her to leave that husband. So we're going to have to figure out what's the difference between the resha where she can stay with the Avad, and the Sefa, where she cannot stay with the Avad. So we ask, Maishina Resha, O Maishina Sefa, Amad Abaye, Abaye has the first answer, we're going to see a couple of answers. Targema Be'ed Ehad, perhaps we're talking not about two witnesses, even though the language of the Braita says explicitly two, uh, we'll change it to one witness. Ed Ehad Omer Nit Kadesha, Ve'ed Ehad Omer Lo Nit Kadesha, you have one when it says she did do Kiddushi and one not. Now both are orig- talking about someone who originally was Pinuya. She was unmarried. So she has a Hazaka going into it in, into this that she was unmarried <clears throat> the one witness is trying to break the chazaka her prior uh, status quo to say you know now she is married where the other one is saying no she is remains with the chazaka so therefore the with the one witness who says she remains is stronger okay now so we would prefer that she would not get married until you verify what's going on with that other witness that says she did get kiddushin uh, but bidiyavad her status quo will uh, is stronger than uh, the one witness that says is against the one witness who says she did get kiddushin is only one witness and that's not sufficient where you need two witnesses in other words the chazaka is strong and the only way to undo a chazaka is with two witnesses so Abaya has to change this from two witnesses to one witness because if in fact there are two against two then the two that says she got kiddushin would be strong enough to undo the chazaka. So that chazaka is no longer relevant, and you just have two against two. But with one, uh, one witness is not strong enough against chazaka, so the chazaka and the one witness that she is uh, uh, um, that she is not married are stronger, not so strong that she can do a lecha techila, because you would always want to uh, find out why there is some rumor or one witness about this. But strong enough that they don't have to get divorced. Sefa, uh, where the case of divorce, you have only one uh, that she got divorced and one she didn't. They're both testifying to a woman who her prior status, her chazaka, is that she was married. Everyone agrees she was married. The question is, did she divorce now or not? So, the one who says she is now divorced is only one witness. And that's not sufficient when you would need two because she has a chazaka beforehand. That's a status quo is very strong. To undo a chazaka, you need two to say she got divorced. So, if as we originally read the Braita, we had two, and that would uh, break the Chazaka. The other two would be contradictory witnesses, and therefore uh, it's 50 50 in limbo, so she has to get divorced. 50 um, uh, 50 in limbo, then she would not have to get divorced, but the Abad. But 
because there's only one witness here, uh, therefore we stick with the prior chazaka, and the one witness uh, that says she got divorced is not sufficient to break that chazaka. So if she remarries, um, she has to go ahead and get divorced. Okay, good. So that was Abaye's uh, explanation, which is combining the chazaka and the fact that it's one witness. Rav Hashem says, no, no, I don't want to big, make such a big change and say it's two witnesses to what the, the Braita as it is, you know, we'd rather uh, change something and uphold it rather than just say it doesn't make sense. So, but Rav Hashem says, I can leave the two witnesses there. I have to make another change. I have to actually switch the two laws. Uh, he's also changing the language of the negative uh, witnesses. Two witnesses says, we saw they did Kiddushin. The other two witnesses say, we did not see that she did Kiddushin. Uh, so this is a weaker language. Beforehand they said, we know that she didn't do Kiddushin. Here it just says, we didn't see. Um, well, we, we never saw it happen, um, but maybe it happened when they weren't looking. Okay. For that reason, the kid, the ones who says that she got kiddushin are stronger, and so than the ones that said she they never saw it, and therefore she should not uh, get ma- re- remarried to a second guy. And if she does, she has to leave, All right? Because second witnesses are pretty weak. So we ask, Bishita, isn't this obvious? Lodi inua and aya saying. I didn't see is no proof, right? Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. This is how the Talmud says it. Uh, so uh, the, the second witnesses are hardly anything. Uh, the answer is, We're talking specifically about a case where the witnesses live in the same courtyard. They're neighbors with the person that they're testifying about. So if you're the next door neighbor, you live in the same courtyard, you're going to see if they she went out one day with a wedding dress, if they had a ceremony, if there were balloons in front of the house, right? There was uh, some gathering, meeting of the family. They would have uh, they would have known and seen it. Um, so therefore, I might have thought if there was an engagement, then certainly the neighbors would have heard, and so maybe their testimony is val is is uh, as as strong as the ones who says that she had kiddushin. So now we know from this baraita that sometimes people do kiddushin in private. They elope. They don't want anybody to know. Maybe the guy doesn't want to make a big announcement because he doesn't want someone else to come and uh, and uh, and sweep uh, up his. Uh, uh, his bride in front of him, or maybe the parents don't like uh, him or her, whatever. They do it, and sometimes people do things in private. All you need is two witnesses and the bride and the groom. Uh, so then it would not have uh, um, a call. That explains the Resha. Sefa, Shanaim Omrim Lino Shit Karasha. Shanaim Omrim Lori Lino Shit Karasha. So same thing here. Two say we know that they, she, everyone knows she was married. Two say we know that she got divorced. Two say we didn't see her get divorced. So we're not, it's pretty weak. Nevertheless, she should not get remarried because there are two witnesses that never saw it, so we have to take that into account. If she already got married, then what's the big deal? These two witnesses, they never saw it. So what? They never saw it. Maybe they were away. Uh, they don't see everything. So now we're asking, isn't this obvious? So it's because two people said we didn't see it. Why, why should we expect everyone to see everything? So it, and so what is this teaching us? That if they live in this, because they live in the same courtyard, and if they live in the same courtyard, then they probably would have seen if there was some kind of divorce. Um, but that's the same as Eresha. So why would you need both, both clauses to teach the same thing? I might have thought that, yeah, Kiddushin, there are people that like to elope and uh, do Kiddushin in private. But regarding Gitin, if they really did it, then uh, this would be a more public thing. Usually these are more public, you know, it's important for people to know that uh, she's single, that he's uh, out of the marriage. Uh, Therefore we need both Resha and Sefa to teach not only Kiddushin, but also also Get. Sometimes people do it in private, maybe they're embarrassed, maybe uh, they don't want someone to know. And so that is also done in private, and uh, uh, and therefore, uh, this is Rav Hashem's explanation of the Braita, 
and that the second set of witnesses are weaker. They don't say we know that she is um, uh, uh, prohibited, but we never saw. Okay. The mission he said Bao Edim Lote said. Next clause in the Mishnah uh, was that uh, if uh, if uh, we, we had two cases there, uh, one regarding a divorcee who comes and says, um, I was married, but I am divorced, and uh, in which uh, we believe her. Uh, when there are no other witnesses, because Apesha so Peshi the Sefa there also said that if she says I was I was taken captive and we didn't know before and she was taken captive, but I was not violated. Also, we believe her because no witnesses. The, af, after both of those cases, the Mishnah says, but uh, if she went and got married. Uh, based on the Pesha Sava Pesha Yitir. That was permitted. She got married in permission. If witnesses came afterwards and said that, oh, we know she was married, they take away her migo, or we know that she was taken captive, and they take away that uh, uh, that migo, they take away the Pesha Asad. Nevertheless, because she's married already, so she can remain married. So a simple reading of the Mishnah might be that that last clause, that permission to remain married if she, if she already is married, even if witnesses come afterwards, it seems to be going on both clauses, but um, the uh, Amoraim say no, it's only going on one clause. Rabbi Oshaya matne la aresha, Rabbi Abad Avin matne la asefa. Rabbi Oshaya says it's, all, it's talking about the first clause, actually both, and the Rabbi Abad Avin says no, only about the last clause, the one about captive. Now let's see why. The one who puts it, who says it's true for the divorced woman. So a divorced woman is a more stringent case. And, and nevertheless, the rabbi was, uh, we have, if you apply, Rabbi Oshaya applied the, the leniency that if the witnesses come after she's already married, she can remain married all the more so with a, cap, a captive woman. Because a cap, why is a captive woman more, more lenient? Because even if she was taken captive, it's not necessarily true that she was violated. Some captors do violate, some don't. And uh, therefore, um, we saw a case a while ago where a woman was taken captive, but she says, I'm nida. And then so they didn't, they left her alone. So uh, therefore, it's only a possibility uh, that if she, was taken, if she was taken captive, that she was violated and prohibited to a Kohen. And so therefore, all the more so if she already already married to a Kohen, uh, and then witnesses come and say, we know that she was taken captive, we're not going to make her get divorced. Uh, all the more so if you say that in a case where... Um, she was for sure married. Okay, Uman de Matne La Asefa, whereas Raba Bar Abin, who says it's only talking about the second clause about the captive woman, that's where, since maybe she was violated, maybe not, if the witnesses come after her and say, we know she was taken captive, she can stay with her Kohen husband. Uh, yes, that's true, but he would not apply it to the Resha, where the witnesses come after she's married and say she was previously married, and now that takes away her amigo, now so for sure she was prohibited. And she, based on her own state word, said, I was divorced, but that's not sufficient. So according to Rabba Bar Avin, we would make her get divorced from her second husband if witnesses should come and say, we know that she was once married. Good. What's at the essence of their machloket? Perhaps it is the statement of Rab Hamnuna that we saw yesterday that says a woman would not be so brazen to say to her husband that uh, you divorced me if it weren't true. So Rav Oshaya, who is more lenient here, uh, he says he agrees with Rav Hamnuna. So if a woman says, I, uh, I am divorced, she wouldn't lie totally and say she's divorced if she's not. So if she says she's divorced, then it's likely it's true. And therefore, she once had a pesha sashetet, even if the witnesses come after she's married, will re- let her remain married, because probably she's not so brazen to lie like that. And maybe Rabba Bar Abin, who applies it only to the 
captive case, he would say, woman would lie and say, I am divorced, even though there is no truth to that. And therefore, we can, once the witnesses come and we know she was married, she can't stay with her second husband. So are they arguing on that? And is Rav Hamnuna a controversial statement? And we say, Lord, the kula amma it lehu the Rav Hamnuna. Rav Hamnuna has quoted a lot, so we want we will want everyone to agree with him. But rather, they both agree in principle. Rav Hamnuna. The question is, is Rav Hamnuna's assumption true? only when she's face to face in front of her husband that she wouldn't lie or even when she is not in front of her husband she wouldn't lie so rabab avin says i she he would limit the assumption of not only to where the husband is there in that case she's not going to tell her husband in his presence oh you divorced me when it's totally not true but in this case uh, where the husband is not around, she would lie. And so since the husband was not around in this case, and she would lie, we have to expect she would lie. Therefore, when witnesses come and say, we know she was married, so her peshe hitir is not sufficient, and maybe she lied, she has to divorce the husband. Whereas, even not in, when the husband is not around, she wouldn't be so insolent as to just lie outright that she's divorced if she's not, and therefore, I mean, we're not going to rely on that solely, but if we had a pesha asaru pesha itir, and then witnesses come after she's already married and undo the pesha asar, then we can still rely on Rav Hamnuna so that she can remain married. Good. Now, Now, on that clause of the Mishnah, uh, says, once the witnesses come, um uh when they come later then she has to uh then she can remain married amar abu de shmuel lo niset niset mamash ela kevan she tiru al dinase afa pishe lo niset the father of shmuel gives a tremendous leniency in this regard when the mishnah says that a uh, woman that said uh, i was captive but um but i was not violated so we permit her to get married then she gets married and witnesses come and say she was in fact violated she doesn't have to leave of course not everyone agrees with that but shimuel adds another chidush not only if she actually got married even if the court just gave her permission to marry even if she didn't marry yet right so she comes to court says i was violated uh, and uh, but I, uh, I was captive, taken captive, but not violated. We give her a note that says, oh, you can go start dating and you can get married. She started dating. She didn't find anyone yet. She didn't get married yet. In, ma- in the married yet. In the meantime, witnesses come and say, oh, we know that she was taken captive. They don't say anything about 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 violated. So now that takes away her pesha asad. Shmuel says. Even though she didn't get married yet, because the betin gave her permission to marry, you can't take it away. She can get married. That's amazing. Now, hold on. The Braita, the Mishnah says she does not need to uh, leave her marriage. Lotese implies that she is actually married, right? How can you interpret those words? Um, if she is not yet married, and the answer is lotese metaraishon. The lotese applies to the permission that the betin gave. The permission gave her betin. The betin gave her a, a, a paper. You can marry, so she doesn't. She is not removed from that initial permitted status. That's how you can interpret lotese. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, now tenura banan amra. Nishbeti utora ani, veyeshli edim shetehora ani. A variation of the case before. She was, uh, um, she comes, a woman comes and says, I was taken captive, but I was not violated. So I'm tahor, I can marry a Kohen. And she says, I have witnesses that I'm tahor, that I was not violated. But the witnesses didn't come yet. Okay. We don't tell her, oh, you have, you know, some witnesses, you have to wait. To, before you get married, you have to wait till the witnesses come so we can verify them. We don't do that because even if she had no witnesses, she would be believed. That's the Mishnah. So she can get married immediately. Now, let's say they did permit her to get married. Uh, so if they permit her to get married and then witnesses came and said, oh, we don't know whether she was violated or not. We know she was taken captive, but we're not sure about the violation. So the witnesses do not back up what she said the witnesses would say. Nevertheless, she does not need to leave her marriage. 
um, because the same same law as the Mishnah, uh, the Chidush here is even though she said the witnesses are going to back me up, and they didn't. Nevertheless, the witnesses did not say that she's Tameh. They just took away her pesha as her pesha yitir. But the Betin already gave her permission to marry. Um, but if witnesses came and said, we know that she was violated when she was taken into captivity, then even if she has children, she has to leave because then it's 100% for sure she was violated. She cannot remain married to the Kohen. Okay, this Baraita seems to support the father of Shemuel's statement because it says, um, they gave her permission, and then the witnesses come. Still, lo uh, tese. Even doesn't say that she actually got married. Just that they gave her permission to get married, and then that sticks. Uh, um, even if she didn't get married, like the father of Shemuel said. All right, now we have uh, a very interesting story. There were captive women, they were brought in the These captors, they're not like modern kidnappers that they hide in some basement somewhere, um, but they walk around with their, with their people that they're taken captive, they're, you know, uh, uh, and the public thugs. And they come to the middle of Nahara and they tell, look, we have, uh, we have women that we captured. Anybody want to redeem them? So, that, you know, they didn't want to kill them. Uh, they just wanted to get money. So the father of Shemuel got guards to stand guards to protect the woman from the captors. So interestingly, these captors, they don't seem to be that violent that they would not, and they would actually allow uh, guards from the Jewish community to come and make sure that the captors don't violate the woman while they're in captivity. Okay, so I guess these guards are not, they're not armed guards, but they're just watching that nothing happened. Perhaps the captors would agree to this because um, if the women are not violated, then they would be worth more. And so it's in the captors' self-interest to have, the, have them not violated, maybe. Okay. Anyway, he put the he put the guards there, and that way, uh, you know, if the guards said uh, they weren't violated, that would help the women. So Shemuel, the the son of uh, the father of Shemuel, said, "Well, until now, who was watching them? In other words, these girls were when they were captured. Uh, who knows? In another city, uh, on the road somewhere, and nobody was guarding them that, all that time. And therefore, we have to suspect." that they were violated, and therefore they're already going to be prohibited to marry a Kohen. So how does it help that you're giving, putting a guard now to guard them from now on that they, they won't be violated by the captors if they're already prohibited anyway? Amale, the father of Shemuel, says very sharply, If these captive women were your own daughters, would you uh, treat them so lightly? In other words, so what if, they're, if their status is already that they uh, suspected and they can't marry a Kohen? Would you want them to be violated again? Right? Uh, just even, if, even if it won't detract from their status any further, still, we want to protect them. If it was your own daughter, you would not want her to be, even if, and even if she was perhaps violated before, you wouldn't want, you would want her to be protected again. So it's not only for uh, to help them halachically in the future, also just to guard them. Okay. Havai Kishkash is a good answer. Havai Kishkagash Yosemit Ifne Hashali. So Shemuel said something in error, but sometimes when someone says something even in error, Pasuk and Kohelet says, like an error that comes from a king, a ruler. If a ruler says something, you know, off with his head, even if he makes a mistake, that's it, they take his head off, right? Nowadays, if a CEO of a company said, oh, the company's doing badly, then the stock is going to tank. Even if he goes back and says, no, I made a mistake, it was not going, then nevertheless, people lose their, um, uh, uh, their their interest in it, and so uh, you have to always be careful, even to w- what you say when you're a great person. And so Shemuel, because he said this negative thing that was uh, that that treated these women lightly, as if he doesn't care if they get violated again. Uh, so Sure enough, it happened to him. His own daughters, the daughters of Shemuel, were taken captive. Israel. They were taken captive in Babel, and then the captors brought them to Eretz Israel to uh, redeem, to get ransom. Now, these are the daughters of Shemuel. So they grew up in the house of Torah, and they know the halacha. 
if they come and say, you know, if they come and show up to the rabbis with the captors there, then the rabbis say, okay, we know you were captive, and now it's a problem, you can't get remarried. So these women, they were very smart. They told their captors, listen, we're going to come to the Bet Midrash, right? The point is to announce that their captors here raise money. But listen, they told their captors, you guys wait outside, let us enter the Bet Midrash alone. And they won't know that you're outside. So the, these captive women go ahead alone in the Bet Midrash while the captors remained outside. And so one of the, the daughters of Shemuel says, I, she admits I was taken captive, but they didn't violate me. Other one also says I was taken captive and they didn't violate me. So the rabbis in the Bet Midrash, they looked up the Mishnah and says they're right there. Hapesha Asad, Hu because they're the ones that admitted that they were taken captive, but they also assured us that they were not violated, therefore they can marry a Kohen Veshari and Hu. So they permitted them, they gave us a slip of paper, you're good. Sof ul atu shabu yanhu. Then, after a few minutes, the captors walked in, the, walked into the door, and so now it's clear that they would have known anyway that they were captors. So Rabbi Chanina says these must be the daughters of of great teachers that they would know right, uh, um, that that know how to use this loophole to get themselves to be permitted to a kohen by having the captors outside. So he says, I don't know who they are. They're from a different land. They, he didn't recognize them. He's not Israel. But then they, they, they found out that sure enough, they were in fact the daughters of Shemuel. And so this is permitted. We see here, this is, um, follows the opinion of the father of Shemuel because they didn't get married on the spot. Uh, rather, the Betin just said, okay, you're permitted to marry. Once they got that permission, that permission sticks. Even though the captors themselves came in two minutes later, it doesn't undo the permission that the Betin gave, and then they can go get married a year or two later, even to a Kohen. So this here, Rabbi Hanina, the one who said, wow, what a great loophole you guys found. Uh, 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 you must be uh, you must be daughters of a great man. So Rabbi Chanina told Rav Shemin Baraba, "Pok itapal bikroba otecha." So he told Rav Shemin, "Hey, look, these daughters are relatives of yours. Uh, apparently, they're cousins or something." And so he says, "Go take care of them. Meaning, go marry them. Right? They're here. We redeem them, and uh, you know, it will be a nice thing for you to uh, to take care of them." Amale Rabbi Chanina. Uh, he says, no, but maybe, maybe there are witnesses somewhere overseas, and maybe they'll come and they'll testify that they were taken captive. This is a bit strange because we know they were taken captive. The captors were right there. So what does it mean that they we, there were witnesses? Okay, we're gonna the Gemara is gonna explain this uh, in a, in a minute that the, perhaps there are witnesses from overseas, meaning maybe from Bavel, where, where they were taken captive or somewhere on the way that will say they were actually violated, and we know they were violated, and then that would be a problem. Okay, but right now we're not we're assuming that we you know he's he's worried about some uh, witnesses that say she's taken captive. Hashtami atletim kaman edim besad astan vete aser. So the Bichani says, why are you worrying about that? Uh, right now, there's no witnesses that are, are giving us a problem. So he cites a proverb that says the witnesses are in the north. Uh, should we prohibit something just in case someone might come and say it's prohibited sometime in the future? Right now, we gave them permission. Follow through on the permission. Go marry them. Tama de la atu adim. Atu adim mitasra. So now we ask. The only reason why he said you can go marry is because the witnesses did not come. But if witnesses did come, then they would become prohibited. And this would go against the father of Shemuel's statement that says that uh, the father of Shemuel says, as long as the Betin gave them permission, they remain permitted even if witnesses come. But according to this, if witnesses come, then they will become prohibited. That's the question. This explains this, this conversation. We weren't talking about uh, uh, um, uh, witnesses of captivity. We know they were captive. The captives walked into the Ben Midrash right after that. So rather, uh, the, what he was worried of, Shimon was worried about, is witnesses that would come and say that she was in fact violated. 
We saw them. We saw the captives violate these women on the way. Uh, and uh, therefore, if those types of witnesses came, uh, whether before they got married, even after they got married, witnesses came and said she is prohibited to a Kohen, 100% then she would have to leave, even if they already were married for a long time and had children. Uh, so uh, with that understanding, the conversation makes total sense. All right, fantastic. Now, next Mishnah. Shete nashim shenishbu. Zot omeret nishpeti utora ani. Vezot omeret nishpeti utora ani. E nan ne emanot. Two women were taken captive. Or one says, I was taken captive, but I'm I'm okay. I'm uh, I was not violated. And the other one says, I was taken captive, and I was not viol- violated. They are not believed. But if they testify about each other, that, yeah, we were taken captive, but she was not violated. The other one says, I was taken captive, but she was not violated. Then they are believed. This Mishnah is talking about a case where there are, in fact, two witnesses that, that say that they were taken captive. So there's no apeshe asad or apeshe etir. We know they were taken captive, and therefore they are not believed about themselves to say, I am, ta- I am tehora. No, there's no, no good. We know that you were taken captive, so no pesha asad, not, not believed. But if they testify about each other, then we have another principle that one witness is believed in certain cases, for example, to say that a husband is dead so the wife can remarry, and also so that we don't have aguna, and also to help out a captive woman. Also, right, we, they, they're uh, um, in a difficult situation, so the rabbis wanted to, to go an extra mile and say, you know what, we'll believe one witness, including a woman, if, that, uh, if they say that you are, you were, we know you're taken captive, but if one witness says you were not violated, we'll believe her. You're not going to be believed about yourself, but they can testify about each other. Okay, so with these um, principles, we can understand the following baraita. It's actually a tosefta that expands on the variations of cases of the Mishnah. Uh, one woman says, I am Tameh, and my colleague, my friend, she is Tehora. She is believed on both counts. Right, she's believed to say she is tameh. A person can always make themselves tameh. Uh, usually, we're going to see exceptions, um, and she is believed to talk about the other one that she is believed. Good, uh, that she is tahor. Ani Torah vechebrati temea. The op- and opposite, and anemen. She's not believed on either. She's not believed about herself because there's witnesses that no, we know that say she was in captivity. So there's no apesha sav apeshitir. And if she testifies about someone else. Well, then she is not believed. Then she's also not believed. So, what about the other woman? What does she have going for her? The Gemara is going to explain. Uh, if they say both of us are tameh, she's believed to prohibit herself, but she's not believed to prohibit her friend. If she says we're both tahor, she is believed about her friend, but not about herself. Okay, now let's see these cases. Amar mor, ani Torah vechaberati teme'a. This is actually the second case, right? The first case was, the case was evident, but we have to explain the second one. Uh, so if she says, I am pure, but my friend is not, enan emenet, she is not believed. Now, if there are no witnesses, right? Um, we were, I was assuming before, like the Mishnah, that there were witnesses there, they were taken captive. But, um, uh, but now we're going to question that. If there were no witnesses that they were taken captive, then well, how come she's not believed about herself? She said, I am taken captive and I'm, I'm tehora, so she should be believed. Um, rather, it must be that there are witnesses, there are witnesses that she was taken captive, and therefore um, she is not believed regarding herself. Good. Hold on. What about this? Is actually the third case. We, that was the second case. Now is the third case. She says both of us are She can make herself prohibited, but she can make her friend prohibited. Oh, why not? Why isn't she believed also about her friend? There are witnesses that said that uh, that there were that they were taken captive. 
rather must be that there were no uh, um, there was no there were no t- uh, 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 witnesses that say they were taken captive, and therefore she's only one witness um, that uh, that says Temea. So we're not we can someone can prohibit themselves, but they can't prohibit their friend. Okay, good. So the first the second clause has to be. Well, there are witnesses, this, but the third clause must be that there are no witnesses. So we have a problem here, but the problem is even greater. And Masefa, the very last clause, the fourth one of the Tosefta says, We were both Tahor, she is, she is believed regarding her friend, because we believe one witness, um, as long as it's not yourself. Um, that's fine, but not about herself. But if there's no edim, as you just said in the third clause, then the fourth clause, she should be believed because rather must be that there are witnesses that they were taken captive, and that's why she is not believed about herself, but she still believed that her better friend, because even one witness is sufficient, um, uh, even though there's no apesha so because there are witnesses. Okay, so now here's here's the problem. The second and fourth clauses have to be that there are witnesses that they were taken captive. Whereas the third clause must be where there are no witnesses. Says, yes, that's right. Right, the Baraita the Tosefta wanted to just bring every variation, um, and uh, but even though uh, some of them are based on different assumptions of the uh, uh, factors of the case, whether they were edim or not. All right, uh, not so um, appealing. I can explain the whole Tosefta uh, when there are witnesses that say that she was taken captive. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, he solved one problem, and now he's going to have to introduce a whole nother uh, clause that isn't there. Besides the two witnesses that say that she was taken captive, there is also one witness that says the opposite of whatever the woman testifies about. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be fun. She makes herself teme'a and her friend tehora. Um, that was the first clause, which was easy to understand. Um, now, there are witnesses, so that's fine. And one witness says, no, I disagree with what you said. You made yourself, to, uh, you said you were violated, I say you are tahor. But your friend who you say was tahor, I say she's tameh. Now, what's the case? In this case, we believe her. Why? She made herself prohibited, so uh, 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 people are believed to make themselves prohibited. But her friend, you have one witness, the, the woman uh, says she, she's tehora. One witness, some other guy who says teme'a. When you have one against one, in general, it's going to cancel each other out. But when the rabbis empower one and we say we believe one, then has a power like two to counteract one. We saw that principle yesterday or two days ago. Um, so therefore, her uh, testimony that her friend is tehora overpowers the power of good, overpowers the that of prohibition of his. That explains the first clause. Second clause. So the she says, I'm Tahor, my friend is Tameh. The one witness says, No, the opposite. You are Tameh, your friend is Tehora. She said, I'm Tehora. But there are witnesses that we know that they were taken captive. So even without the one witness that says she's Tameh, already we wouldn't believe her. There's no Peshe Saru Peshe Tir. But her friend, but her friend, even though she said she's Tameh, but the one, one. Let's assume he's a man. Male witness says that your friend is tehora. So again, it's one against one. But when you have one against one, the power of tehora uh, is more is like two and overcomes the one uh, her testimony about her friend. Good. So that's that makes sense. Why we don't believe her. In both of these cases, she says we're both tema. A one witness comes and says you're both tehora. 
Tehorim. Ihi shavita nafshech atichad yisurah. So she says, I'm tamea. So she's believed to prohibit herself. Chaberta mishtaria pumad de'ayed. Whereas her friend is going to be permitted based on the one witness that's more powerful than one witness against. Okay, now we ask. Katula mali. Hainu resha. We know all the principles. We, we could have figured all this out from the first two clauses. They already gave us all these principles. So what is this third case even adding? Because I might have thought that we should actually permit her herself and not believe her own testimony that she is Tema'a. Why? Maybe they hate each other. And the woman who's testifying hates the other one so much that she would be willing to say, I am Tema'a, and prohibit herself from marrying Kohen, just so that she'd be more believed when she says, my friend was also Tema'a. I mean, it makes more sense. If the captors violate one, they probably violated both. So she maybe lied and said, I am Tamed just to put herself in trouble, just like Shimshon says, I am willing to be a suicide bomber, I'll kill myself as long as I kill the Pilish team also. Um, and and um, and in that case, uh, we would have thought that we don't actually we actually don't believe her to say tema, but we believe the uh, the one witness that says she's tehora, and we would permit her. And therefore, I need the third case to teach me that that is not true. That we do not assume a person would lie about themselves and make themselves tema, even if it's to injure someone else. But rather, she remains tema. Good. Ani vechabarati tehora. The last clause, she says, we're both Torah. Uh, uh, one witness says, no, you're both Tema'im. For, her, for herself, we don't believe her because there are witnesses that we know that she was taken captive. So there's no Pesha, so uh, for sure she's Tema'a, adding that to the one witness for sure. There's no, no chance for her. But the other woman, even though one witness says she's Tema'a, the the power of Torah is stronger, and therefore her friend who says Torah makes her permitted. Now again, Mali, Why do we need this? This we already know this from the first case. Uh, so what's the what's the point of teaching us again? We could have figured it out from the same very same principles. Because I would have thought that when we believe someone to, uh, um, that when she prohibits herself, rather, we, we would have thought that a woman is believed regarding her friend, that her friend is Tahora, only when she says about herself that she's Temea. Um, and that was the first clause. But in the case where she says, I am Tehora and my friend is Tehora, then maybe she's actually lying about uh, her friend. And she just wants to make, say she's saying her friend is Tehora to make herself look look more credible. Uh, so, Kamash Malan, therefore we need the last clause to teach that even when uh, she says both of us are Tehora, she is believed regarding her friend, but not about herself. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.